Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, event, Analyzing Russia and the Changing Ideas Industry, Addressing the Decline of Regional Expertise in Academia and the Policy World, where we are going to uh, listen to, celebrate, perhaps debate, and reflect upon Professor Dan Dresner's new book, The Ideas Industry. Um, you might wonder, what is the Harriman Institute in partnership with the Jordan Center doing hosting uh, Dan Dresner? Um, and there's two part answer to that. One is that actually Dan used to write a lot about Russia, and I think <laughs> he'll be writing more about Russia uh, going forward. Actually, his economic sanctions book, his first one, has a lot of material there about Russia and the post-Soviet uh, um, space. Um, but actually, the uh, idea was uh, Dr. Yana uh, Gorovskaya, who's our uh, great uh, postdoc in Russian politics, who sort of had the idea, well, why not have a reflection and a debate about um, uh, the changing political economy, the ideas industry, as it pertains to Russian expertise. So this is a grand kind of experiment we're undertaking here, right? There's no script for this, um, but I'm hoping, given the quality of the people here, um, it gives us some food for thought. So my name's Alex Cooley. I direct the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. Um, this is Josh Tucker, who directs uh, the Jordan Center Russia Studies um, at NYU, and together we convene um, the New York Russia Public Policy Series with generous support from the Carnegie Corporation. We thank them. Uh, the idea behind this seminar is to create some constellations that might not be usual, um, but that contribute uh, to policy debate for a New York audience um, regarding uh, topics that are in the news or topics of importance uh, pertaining Russia. So this is the last seminar of this semester, uh, but the next one is going to be held at NYU on February 1st, and it's going to be about the politics of the World Cup, um, which we won't be part of, but will be <laughs> happening uh, in Russia. Uh, and that will include Natalie Koch from uh, Syracuse University, Jane Buchanan from Human Rights Watch, and hopefully Gabriel Marcotti, ESPN uh, correspondent. So that one will be held at NYU on February 1st. So I don't want to dwell too much uh, on uh, the speakers and their distinguished bios, but let me introduce them uh, in order of appearance. So uh, Dan will kick things off, and he's a professor um, uh, of political science or international politics at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He's written numerous books, uh, and again, we're grateful for him making uh, uh, you say that like it's a pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Sometimes oh, I, so many books. You, <laughs> you, maybe that's one thing we can talk about. <laughs> um, then, um, then we have two great discussants, um, Alexander Vakru, uh, who is the executive director of the Davis Center at Harvard University. Um, she will be providing uh, uh, commentary. And then uh, Steve Sostanovich, um, who is a uh, professor at... Uh, Columbia School of International Public Affairs, and also uh, the George Kennan Senior Fellow for Russian Eurasian Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. So we have academia covered, policy covered, <laughs> think tanks covered, and I should say about Josh that even if he wasn't co-chairing, he would be a great panelist because he does edit the Monkey Cage blog in addition to sort of commenting and writing on Russia too. Um, so the way we'll start, Dan will kick off from the podium, uh, will give us his sort of book lecture, then um, Alexandra and Steve will offer about 10 minutes of commentary, then Josh will lead the Q&A um, on the topic du jour, and we'll open it up uh, in the end. So, Dan, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Alex and the Harriman Institute, and I think I have to doubly thank the Carnegie Corporation, uh, because in some ways I'm the beneficiary of two different grants uh, that in some ways makes up this book talk. The first being uh, the Bridging the Gap initiative that they launched a few years ago. Uh, which Fletcher was among other, the Fletcher School was one of many schools to receive money from that. And then now I'm one of the co-PIs for um, a Carnegie grant designed to engage in outreach uh, to Russian institutions, Russian institutions of higher education, as a way of fostering track two or track 1.5 uh, uh, communication. Uh, so very, really grateful for that and grateful that I have therefore not been prey to the ideas industry that I'm about to talk about. Um, <laughs> So to give a sense of, of why I wrote this book, this is a rather arcane topic, and I, I think part of it was because when I entered graduate school uh, to get a PhD in political science, 
I was a relatively young, naive uh, boy thinking, you know, what I want to do is, is get a PhD in political science to understand how the world works. Because then once I understand how the world works, I will write path-breaking articles in, you know, international organization or in world politics. And policymakers will read those articles because surely they must do that. Um, and, and by doing that, I will make a difference. I still remember the, when I was about two or three months away from getting my, uh, my degree, I was almost done with my dissertation and I was toiling away in the, the bowels of the Stanford Political Science Department when the fire alarm goes off. Um, you know, and there actually was a real fire. It wasn't a, 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 a drill. And my first thought, which is just ridiculous, and yet nonetheless every grad student would have it, is it's okay if I die, but I've got to get my laptop out of here because the work, <laughs> the work must live on. That's, the, that's my contribution. Uh, so that was what I thought, you know, going in. And indeed, to be fair, I'm not the only one who's thought this. You know, someone like John Maynard Keynes, for example, very famously said that, uh, you know, both uh, madmen in authority and uh, businessmen rely far more on the ideas of economists uh, and political philosophers than they realize that actually ideas matter far more than interests. Um, on the other hand, as I have progressed in my career, it has begun to dawn on me that things might work a little bit differently from how I sort of had that naive vision. Um, I have to deal with the fact that no matter how many books I write, and as Alex said, there's a lot of them, um, what I will be remembered for, if there is or ever is an obituary for me, the first line is going to mention the fact that I wrote a book about zombies. Um, and I'm really <laughs> proud of that book, don't get me wrong. It's a good book. It recited my house, among other things. <laughs> but nonetheless, I did a lot of other work, but I have to recognize that that's sort of the way things go. Um, and indeed, there's been sort of shifts in the sort of marketplace of ideas um, in terms of how we present things to people. I mean, I'm surely you have all at least seen one or two TED Talks or TEDx Talks. And the funny thing is, as I started writing about this, I was struck by the number of people when they observed this phenomenon have a sort of get off my lawn approach to it, which is to say that academics are not real big fans of the TED phenomenon. And I can sort of understand that for reasons that I'll get into, but it strikes me that anyone who operates in the marketplace of ideas, it's churlish for us to complain that there is this medium out there that actually causes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to actually pay attention to that, an idea for 15 minutes. That strikes me as, a, generally speaking, a good thing. There are problems with it, which I will get to, but uh, it, it still seems weird to me. So I thought I'd write about this, about the changes, um, particularly as I, you know, sort of tried to have a kind of impact. Um, and as, in the end, I wound up writing a book that I think was far more about American politics than it was about international relations. Um, and I'll talk about the argument now, and I'll give some very brief suggestions about how this might affect the Russia field, but in some ways I'm going to defer to those who know far more about Russia and have been to Russia far more recently than I have uh, in terms of how it affects this particular sort of region. So in essence, the book argues that there are two kinds of intellectuals that try to get their ideas out um, to policymakers and for the public to consume. There are public intellectuals and there are thought leaders. Now, you might not like either of these terms, but I've discovered in the process of writing this book, no one likes any of these terms. If I come up with opinion <laughs> leaders or thinkfluencers or anything, no one likes any of these terms. Um, everyone just gets very uncomfortable about it. Public intellectuals are what we might call Isaiah Berlin's foxes, which is to say they know a little bit about a lot. Um, they usually have some area of expertise, but they are perfectly happy to opine about areas beyond their area of expertise because they have a, generally speaking, decent uh, kind of education. Uh, the key thing to realize about public intellectuals is that public intellectuals basically function as critics. Public intellectuals can tell you everything that is wrong with everyone else's idea. That's what they're good at. They're basically the best public intellectuals are the world's best second year grad students <laughs> in the social sciences. So, you know, that's, that's the best way to think about it. Um, thought leaders, on the other hand, are the second kind. Thought leaders are evangelists. Thought leaders are like Isaiah Berlin's hedgehog. So the very famous line by, uh, that Berlin talked about in his essay was, the fox knows you know, a little bit about a lot, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. The hedgehog essentially comes up with one big idea, and they think that that idea can explain everything. In essence, if you talk to a hedgehog, or a thought leader about what, you know, your particular problem, they will somehow find a way to get that problem to go back to their original idea, their original big idea that explains everything. Now, a good marketplace of ideas needs both of these kinds of thinkers. You need thought leaders to constantly inject new ideas into the marketplace because the world is constantly changing and we need new ways of understanding it. 
But then you also need public intellectuals to stress test those ideas to within an inch of their life, to basically gauge and weigh how well they're functioning. The problem happens if the marketplace of ideas is out of sync or out of whack. If you have too many public intellectuals and not enough thought leaders, essentially the barriers to entry are too high. It becomes really, really difficult to introduce a new idea because essentially it will get criticized to within an inch of its life. Um, and so as a result, the marketplace of ideas becomes stagnant and ossified. It's not necessarily bad, but essentially you wind up with sort of traditional mainstream ideas and nothing new is necessarily proposed. And that's problematic. On the other hand, if you're operating in a world in which there are very many thought leaders and not enough public intellectuals, then the barriers to exit are too high. It becomes extremely easy for a thought leader to inject a new idea into the marketplace, into the public sphere. But the problem, the biggest problem, is that bad or stupid ideas don't die. They are not, you know, they're not killed in any way whatsoever. Without enough public intellectuals to sort of point out or highlight the problems, they can persist, almost in a zombie-like fashion, until eventually they're embraced anew. And in essence, what my argument is in the book is that there are three macro trends in the United States that have essentially stacked the deck in favor of thought leaders at the expense of public intellectuals. There are some who read the book who interpret me as sort of attacking thought leaders as a general category, and I'm really not doing that. I do think that we need them. And indeed, if I was writing this book in, let's say, 1965, I'd probably be attacking public intellectuals much more than thought leaders. But we're in the world of 2017, and as a result, I think sort of three macro trends have essentially empowered thought leaders and emaciated or impoverished public intellectuals. The three factors are the erosion of trust of author you know, in authority and expertise, the rise of political partisanship, and the rise of economic, particularly wealth inequality. So let me explain all three of these and also potentially why it might affect uh, the Russia debate. So the erosion of trust and authority and expertise is relatively uncontroversial as a sort of statement of fact. If you take a look at any kind of, you know, longitudinal uh, survey, whether you're talking about Pew or Gallup or the General Social Survey, they all show the same thing, that basically trust in American institutions, whether it's the government or civil society institutions like organized religion or labor or the media or what have you, trust in all of those institutions peaked around 1965, then started to dramatically fall as a result of both Vietnam and Watergate then sort of, you know, ping-ponged around a little bit for the next 20 or 30 years, then had a brief spike after 9-11, and since 9-11 it has just been a long, slow, steady descent down to about 10 percent trust, or about 15 percent trust, with the exception, I should add, of the United States military. The military is the one institution that this hasn't affected. Now, this also affects trust-based, or this also affects what we would consider knowledge-based institutions. So the General Social Survey does, you know, asks uh, Americans for confidence in a variety of institutions that would be associated with higher learning, whether it's education or medicine or what have you. In 1974, the average percentage of Americans that had a high degree of trust in these kinds of knowledge institutions was 50 percent. By 2012, it was down to 30 percent. And essentially, there's been this slow, steady erosion. And to be fair, partly for valid reasons. There have been a whole variety of ways in which we would consider authoritative institutions to have screwed up. We can think about, you know, in this century, we can point to the war in Iraq or the 2008 financial crisis, or even within our own, you know, field of political science or the social sciences, various sort of examples of academic fraud or failure to replicate or what have you. So to be fair, I'm not saying that the erosion of trust is necessarily always bad, but it's gotten to a point now where essentially public intellectuals who very often occupy academic positions are disadvantaged because they can't do the easiest trick that they used to be able to do in debate, which is to argue from authority. Essentially, if they wanted to make an argument about why such and such was a bad idea, 50 years ago, if, let's say, Alex was to say, I think, you know, uh, you know, sanctioning Russia too heavily would be a bad idea, they would say, oh, well, wow, the Columbia professor and, like, head of the Harriman Institute with the spectacular hair says <laughs> that this would be a bad idea. He must know what he's talking about. Whereas nowadays, if he says that, someone immediately will say, well, what the hell does someone at Columbia know? They're in this out-of-touch elitist bubble. They have no idea what the concerns are about the real world. And as a result, he has to make his case a little more vigorously, which in some ways isn't necessarily bad for us, but it does mean that the transaction cost for us of trying to make the argument becomes more difficult. In a world in which things like authenticity are prized, suddenly thought leaders, which very often develop their arguments from inductive experience, are more empowered. 
And indeed, if you want an example that's relevant to Russia, we might as well bring up the elephant in the room, which is Russian interference in the U.S. election, which is to say there hasn't necessarily been the kind of effect that we would have expected from, let's say, the October 2016 announcement by intelligence agencies of, oh, by the way, Russia's interfering in the election, or the January 2017 announcement of a sim you know, to a similar degree. The second trend, which is also why Alex would be less powerful now than he would have been 50 years ago, is the rise of political polarization. And again, essentially, if, whether you take a look at polling of, you know, voting, uh, voting patterns in the House of Representatives, or whether you poll party leaders or elites um, on both sides, or whether you actually look at sort of mass public opinion, they all show the same thing, which is essentially Democrats have moved further to the left in the last 50 years, and Republicans have moved way, way, way further to the right um, at the same time. Uh, this is most concentrated among party elites, and indeed, Part of this can be explained by a phenomenon called partisan sorting, which is to say that it's not so much that, always, that, that people are going way too much to the, the ideological extremes. It's more that Southern Democrats realized that they were actually Republicans, and New England Republicans, Rockefeller Republicans, realized they were actually Democrats. So part of that is a sorting phenomenon. But the trend is actually worse than that, in the sense that if you actually poll elite attitudes about people on the other side, what it means is they wind up thinking that the other side is not just wrong, but actually inherently evil or pernicious. Indeed, it's now to the point where if you ask you know, these party elites, they don't want their children to marry outside of their political persuasion. So in some ways, political ideology has replaced race or gender or sexual orientation as in some ways one of the defining forms of political identity in American life. And indeed, there's been survey experiments that shows um, in terms of hiring patterns, that someone who's either an extreme Democrat or extreme Republican is far more likely to discriminate based on political ideology than based on race or religion or sexual orientation. Now, how does this affect the marketplace of ideas? Essentially, what it means is that partisans on both sides want their own house intellectuals, and they don't want to be told that they're wrong. And this is a problem for public intellectuals. Public intellectuals are almost by definition heterodox. They are often going to say, well, I agree with the, you know, the left on certain things, but I think the right has a point on some other things. This is particularly true in the world of, of foreign policy and area studies and international relations. And so as a result, these sorts of you know, ideological extremes will basically want to hear only from their own partisans telling them that whatever you already thought was true is absolutely correct. And this poisons a debate like, what do you do about Russia? And we've seen this on both sides, where you have Trump partisans who refuse to believe that there is any possibility that Russia actually played a role in the 2016 election, or that maybe it's questionable whether you know, the Trump administration should think of uh, Vladimir Putin as a reliable partner. But at the same time, on the left, there was a remarkable conviction that Russia was responsible for everything. And if you even suggest the possibility that maybe there wasn't an orchestrated conspiracy, that maybe Donald Trump did not knowingly actually do this, it's actually going to be a problem. And so as a result, persuasion becomes extremely difficult. And indeed, there's survey research that shows that when an issue is already politically polarized, it doesn't matter if you have an expert consensus on something. The expert consensus is not going to change anything. The final trend, and in some ways the most important, is the rise of economic inequality. So again, over the last 50 years, we know that the following is true. Life has been pretty darn good for the top 1% of income earners in the United States, but life has been super awesome for the top 0.01%. And the top 0.01% are the plutocrats. They're the ones Sorry, with enough money. They're the ones who are going to benefit from the tax bill if it actually goes through. Um, and essentially, what has happened to these people is that they have more money than they know what to do with. So what do they want to do with it? They actually want to go back to college. But they don't go back to college. They don't even necessarily fund traditional universities. What they do is create their own intellectual salons. Or they attend other intellectual salons. They hopscotch from the World Economic Forum in Davos to South by Southwest in Austin, to the Milk and Global Conference, to TED, to the Aspen Ideas Festival, in which they basically only encounter either other billionaires or policy mandarins willing to speak truth to them, or not so much truth. I mean, one of the, the original purposes of public intellectuals was the notion of that you're supposed to speak truth to power. But speaking truth to power is really hard. Speak, if you think speaking truth to power is really hard, though, try speaking truth to money. It's almost impossible, all right? Because basically, if you do that, you are essentially risking potentially your own feed train. And the last thing that plutocrats want to hear 
is from experts who tell them that whatever their preconceived view that they may be ginned up from like reading The Economist for five minutes in a first class <laughs> lounge is the way the world actually works. And what they certainly don't want to hear, which they often will from let's say political scientists, is the reason those people are rich is not because of their own skill or will, but maybe just maybe that they were born on third base. And that is not, definitely not something they want to hear. Thought leaders, on the other hand, will excel in this kind of environment. Thought leaders are perfectly happy to tell these people that they reached where they were because they were disruptors, because they truly changed the world, because they had counterintuitive ideas. And as a result, those will be the people you know, that will wind up getting funded or maybe picked to advise Donald Trump in terms of Russia uh, in, in uh, 2017. Indeed, there is no way you can explain Carter Page's existence, period without thinking about the phenomena that I'm talking about in respect to the modern ideas industry. So the result in all of this is that you essentially have more demand for intellectuals, period, but you have particular demand for, public, or for thought leaders. And indeed, one of the reasons why you have a demand for thought leaders in particular is that they excel in a world in which there is low degrees of trust, high degrees of partisanship, and plutocrats just begging to be told that what they think is true is actually true. Um, and furthermore, the one last thing I will mention, and then I think I've, have I gone on? Yeah, I've gone on a little bit. The one thing I'll uh, say is that this is also a reason why the TED phenomenon benefits thought leaders far more than public intellectuals. Because if you think about the typical TED talk, the typical TED talk is tailor-made for a thought leader. Because the typical TED talk starts by saying, here's a topic. Here's the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is wrong. What if I tell you a narrative that completely blows your mind and changes the way you think about this? And then your mind is blown, and it ends with a standing ovation. And then they cut away. So I've often been asked, will I, you know, would I ever give a TED Talk if I ever was invited to on this topic? And the answer I always give is that, yes, I would agree to do a TED Talk on one condition, which is if I do a TED Talk, I've only got 15 minutes, I'm only going to talk for 10, and then I would want to discuss and to talk for five to explain why I might be wrong. I have no problem with the TED format as a general principle. I do like the idea of blogs or other forms of, of ways of engaging the public. I think that's all to the good. I just want TED Talks with discussants. And with that, I will close. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Dan. And I just want to make a quick uh, claim here. As Alex said, we've had this uh, ongoing series now going on for the last year of the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. And we do, as you'll note, we're live streaming this right now. But we also archive our, uh, our previous, uh, all of our previous events. And the most recent event in the series was actually held at NYU a few weeks ago, which was on the New York, on the uh, Russia and the U.S. 2016 election. So we had a very good discussion with lots of opposing viewpoints at that panel. And I would invite you all, if you're interested, to check it out online. You can get to it to the Jordan website. You can get through it to the Harriman website. But the whole, the whole conversation is archived. And with that, I want to turn it over to Sasha. So the context for the discussion is that uh, there's been a lot of hand-wringing among older Russia specialists since the invasion of Crimea over the lack of younger Russia specialists. And uh, the argument that since the decline of the Cold War, no one was studying Russia anymore, and therefore there's a total lack of expertise of anyone between the ages of, say, 25 and 60. Um, <laughs> And it's completely not true, actually. And it, it, the irony is that some of the people doing the most vigorous hand-wringing are, in fact, the ones who have trained those younger specialists who are rising up within academia, within think tanks, and different aspects of the ideas industry, and also within government. Um, nonetheless, there is an, a strong problem with regional studies, and it comes primarily from the disciplines, from social sciences. Uh, and that is because the social sciences, the, the academic disciplines within universities, have been moving more and more away from a position that specialization in one particular part of the world gives you the ability to explain what's happening in that part of the world, to the idea that you need to specialize in a theory or a type of methodology that can then explain phenomena in lots of parts of the world. Right? So it's not enough to know something about Russia. You need to, at the very least, be able to compare Russia to other states in the former Soviet Union, or ideally compare it to China, or to compare it to other places, all of which is fine. 
But the result has been that if you, study, if you study Russia, if you get a PhD in Russia studies, you're very unlikely to get a job in a political science department, for example, because you've gone into the ghetto, basically, of, of the academic discipline. This happened with uh, economics a long time ago. It's happened with political science more and more, to the point where I would say that someone who does qualitative analysis of Russia, let's say interview-based analysis of politics in Russia, is very unlikely to get hired at any major political science department in the country. So does that mean that regional, regional studies is dead? Um, and obviously it isn't, or we wouldn't have representatives from three centers and a think tank and a university that's very much engaged with Russia on this panel. Uh, but the, the environment has changed considerably, and what you have are regional centers which are taking the places of departments as sustainers of regional studies. Uh, and that has very important implications, particularly in the context of Dan's third point on inequality. So the problem is that the centers are not staffed with faculty that are paid by departments, that are paid by the university. We are instead the conveners of students and faculty that are interested in the region. And as such, we are responsible for raising the money required to hold the conferences, the seminars, the events, also financial aid for students, also uh, trips to Russia, engagement so that we can bring Russians here, for example. All of that falls on the centers, which is also fine except that the amount of funding has drastically been reduced, in part because of this phenomenon of academics being crowded out by thought leaders. So now in terms of the funding for Russia studies, it's almost exclusively the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, when it comes to government funding, there is Department of Education funding for language studies, for financial aid, but every four years we sit around wondering <laughs> if it's going to be uh, continued or slashed another 46% as it was last time, or if the people who are at so-called elite universities don't need the money at all and therefore will not be able to offer financial aid for their students. And the result of that is we will be moving away from a system where we actually look for the best and the brightest, although it's a cliche, the people who we think are best able to understand Russia, either because of what they've done before they come into a master's or a PhD program, or because of their talents, let's say, with language or other skills. And we will be taking the people who can afford to spend the amount of money that you need to spend, $120,000, $150,000 on an education that guarantees you a, a access to a government job that will probably you know, never allow you to pay off that debt. But it raises a question, which is if everyone's paying attention to the thought leaders and not, and not the academics, um, are academics capable of competing uh, with thought leaders? Um, and to some extent, competition is good, right? Everybody acknowledges that it kind of raises the overall quality of what's going on. Nobody likes to have it themselves, um, but in general, it's a good thing. Um, the, the problem here is that there's self-selection uh, often among professors who uh, want to be deep in a particular subject and spend 10 years studying, for example, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union or youth movements in Kazakhstan and they want to do this deep research and then explain it to other people who've done deep research on the youth movements of Kyrgyzstan. That is what they're really interested in. They're also interested in their students, but their main audience, their professional audience is, as Dan points out, peer-reviewed journals and conferences where they talk to the six or seven other people who know exactly what they're talking about and really appreciate their insights. Now, there are, of course, exceptions to this, some of whom are sitting at the table, and a lot of the younger faculty are trying to do this more and more through blogs and non-academic publishing, but they're very often squashed because they're seen as not serious, wasting their time, writing op-eds instead of writing in peer-reviewed journals, and uh, ironically less likely to get tenure because of that. Now, in many ways, I see that the, the regional studies programs, the master's programs that, that we run, are a sweet spot to resolve some of the tensions between the universities no longer interested in funding regional studies and yet the need for regional studies and experts who understand different countries. And it's not just Russia, obviously. There are Latin American centers and centers for Asia and China. The sweet spot are the master's programs because you can't get the kind of expertise as an undergraduate. Right? Maybe you get some Russian or some language training, but you're not going to have more than six or seven maximum courses on Pushkin Russian history Russian politics, you're not an expert, right? And on the other side, you have PhDs who are going to go off and study something very intensely, very focused. It's going to take them 10 or 15 years until they're free to kind of speak their minds um, and they have tenure and they're going to be doing their own thing and talking to each other. The master's students, however, are in programs for one or two years. They are interested in professional careers, 
Some of them do go on to PhDs, about 20% in our program, for example, but 60% of them go on to government work. And by that I mean the military, intelligence, the State Department, and other agencies in Washington. And then you also have the rest that go into NGOs or businesses and other completely respectable professions. Um, and these are the people who then radiate out from the universities and are able to impart a certain level of solid expertise on the region that can at least counter the thought leader who says something completely stupid, right? And nobody is there in the audience to say, that, that makes no sense, right? Um, but in order to support the master's programs, you can't just teach them all about imperial history and give them the sorts of lectures that we've always done. You actually need to teach them skills. And this is where they become controversial because if we're teaching skills, then like, do we belong at a university? It's not so serious to be teaching someone you know, something practical or, or, or preparing them for a market rather than preparing them to think deep thoughts. And I would say that those things are not incompatible at all. You can be teaching people what they need to know about the political, history, economic, culture of a country, and at the same time, you can be teaching them standards for research. You can be teaching them argumentation. You can teach them how to write, which most of the students don't know how to do, actually, even in our master's program when they arrive. And you can teach them how to communicate effectively. Ideally, you throw in some other skills, like some quantitative skills or geographic analysis or something like that, but you basically make them employable. So they're not just people who know something about Russia, but they can actually do something productive with that knowledge. And I think that that is something that only a university can do, regardless of what's happening with the different thought leaders. Now, in terms of the other points that Dan made, um, the erosion of trust, I mean, that is, is definitely a problem. Um, and the devaluation of credentials is particularly an issue for the faculty that are doing the deepest research. So for example, the ruble collapsed a couple years ago. And the journalist called me, they said, can you give us some commentary on the ruble collapse? And I said, oh, let me find a professor. Someone's got to be able to say something. And the first person I talked to said, well, I need to study this a little bit. <laughs> Could you come back to me in six months? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and that's how it goes, right? But the people who are, who are professors in faculties of arts and sciences are inherently interested in that kind of deep research, which is great because in six months they will actually be able to tell us why the ruble collapsed. But it's not so great in terms of getting some kind of real knowledge out there as opposed to relying on BuzzFeed to get sort of the, the blow by blow of what's happening on the streets of Moscow. So I agree with Dan. I think there is a possibility to have both thought leaders and public intellectuals and academics, some of whom don't really fall into either of those categories. But it's a question of having the right balance and of supporting the institutions that allow that right balance to exist going forward. Thank you. Steve Sostanovich, you rub shoulders with thought leaders and intellectuals and critics and other types. What do you think? Well, Sasha has sort of done the appropriate and high-minded, uh, <clears throat> am I on here? Yeah. Uh, job of uh, actually talking about what we're supposed to talk about in this uh, <laughs> panel. Uh, but I want to go back to what Dan said about the elephant in the room. Uh, because uh, it, it's, come on, why are we here? Uh, this is a big room, but there's still a very big elephant in it. Um, I agree with Dan that ideas are affected by what kind of market there is for them. Uh, buyers and sellers, that, it's, a, it, it's a marketplace and a business, and uh, Russia should not be an exception to that. Uh, but I don't think that the three factors that he focuses on are uh, enough to explain the way in which we think about Russia these days. You know, waning trust in expertise, political polarization, plutocracy. I'm struck by how much the uh, entire Russia issue has uh, led to fits of indignation about how dare you question experts. Um, after all, that's, that, that is the, shoved in the administration's face all the time. You are questioning experts. Uh, that can't be right. And political polarization, uh, it seems to me there's a kind of bipartisan dismissal of uh, uh, a lot of these views. There's a little bit of a Trump effect in the, in the polling, but you know, it's gotten Putin up off the floor of 
you know, the single digits to, uh, to double digits. And I think there are no big uh, dollars going in to support an extreme transformation of views about Russia. And yet an extreme transformation in the past five years has occurred. Um, and so I'd say the most interesting thing about this, uh, uh, about the way we think about Russia is it's not a structural transformation. Uh, th the big think tanks, uh, the big think tank programs are still big. Uh, newspaper bureaus uh, uh, in Moscow are still big. Um, embassy staffs are still enormous, even post expulsions. So in, in the areas where you where a lot, where the government and the penumbra institutions of, uh, of government like think tanks, I mean, I'm talking about the, you know, Washington scene in particular. Um, uh, the, those, uh, those institutions are still um, uh, in place, thriving, creating expertise. Uh, uh, what's different is the orientation. There's a change in the substance of views about uh, uh, Russia, where they used, you know, for a time we went from really, f you know, the Cold War evolution from, you know, 80s, 90s, 2000s to 2010s is hostility, friendliness, indifference, hostility. Um, and, uh, you know, the, that, that trend toward uh, hostility is very pronounced. And it reflects, to my mind, a very a spectacular failure on the part of the Russian government, elites, establishment, to cultivate friends uh, among counterparts in the U.S., uh, in the Western world, or globally. There's not a real constituency, not a real market, Dan, for the idea that Russia could be a valuable partner uh, for Western countries, for the United States. And that was starting to be true really well before 2016. And you don't see that a constituency for that view uh, anywhere on the political spectrum uh, among institutions of government, uh, not in the national security community, not among U.S. allies, nowhere really. I mean, Donald Trump is a, a kind of solitary exception, and there are a few people whose names I don't want to mention, <laughs> who nevertheless from time to time express this view. So I want to spend a little time detailing this failure. Start with the institutions of government. You know, in Congress, in the 90s, after the Cold War, you had a formal bipartisan alliance, you know, Dick Gephardt and Newt Gingrich, to establish good relations with uh, Russia. Now they're down to Dana, I'll mention this now, Dana, <laughs> Dana Rohrabacher. Um, I will say, by the way, Dana Rohrabacher, oh, he could be watching here. Um, whenever I testify before his committee in the Congress, he reminds me of something that is, as far as I can remember, not true. That we played touch football with Putin in the 19, in the 1990s. Yeah. Hockey, maybe. Not yeah. Touch no. Football. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, foreign service officers. There's for, less clientitis toward Russia among foreign service officers who deal with Russia than any group of regional specialists around the globe. It is astonishing, really, how a might have been cadre of Russia hands have become instead Ukraine hands, uh, Georgia hands, Baltic fans, Stan's hands, you know, you could say. <clears throat> Russians used to complain to me about the Cold War mentality that they saw in U.S. defense policy. That, you know, the all, and you still hear this from Putin and people around him. Uh, that it's all driven by the military industrial complex. I had to say to them, no, you know, in the 90s and even after 
9-11, even more so. In the Defense Department, there have been no promotions for people who focus on how to get even with Russia, how to do harm to Russia. People are not interested in Russia in the military uh, industrial complex. It were for a long time. This is changing a little bit. The military shifted to counterterrorism. The intelligence community, the same, with the addition now of cybersecurity. Russia is not at the center of this world, although it is becoming, again, at the center of this world. Both inside and outside the U.S. government, think tanks and elsewhere say that are devoted to arms control. You know, people lost interest in Russia. They're more interested in nonproliferation than in strategic arms control. Um, as a matter of ideology, uh, you know, what, what are the kind of big uh, sort of categories that matter in our political spectrum in American politics? Liberals, conservatives, neoliberals, uh, neoconservatives, none are attracted to Russia. Uh, I make a small asterisk here f for realists, but they usually belittle Russia in a way that the Russians don't appreciate. Just go read John Mearsheimer's description of why NATO expansion was a bad idea. Why was it a bad idea? Because Russia is such a pathetic, declining power. So you get no, you get no respect from, uh, from them. Where else might you find a constituency in the marketplace of ideas for the proposition that Russia could be a valuable partner? Bus the business community? Surprisingly tepid, actually. They don't fund a lot of thinking uh, and thought leaders on Russia. Not a surprise, really, given the low level of trade. We trade more with Chile than with, uh, than with Russia. Did anybody support Exxon's uh, propo uh, you know, uh, request for a sanctions waiver uh, earlier this year? Nobody. Uh, not even the former CEO of Exxon. Um, how about allies as f friends of the proposition that Russia could be a valuable partner? Not in Europe, not in the Middle East or East Asia. Some of those American allies have a kind of, you know, sank uh, relationship with the Russians on the side, but they're not really pushing the U.S. for a different approach. Intellectuals, the public intellectuals and thought leaders in Dan's excellent book are not, are not friends of Russia. And how can they be? A regime that persecutes intellectuals, artists, theater, and movie directors, is not going to win friends. So the real problem with the marketplace of ideas is, uh, the, and, and the, uh, the factors that have pushed the marketplace of ideas toward uh, critical views of Russia, is, I, I'm afraid, more Russian behavior uh, than anything else. And a lot of institutions have found themselves uh, swept up uh, in that. Um, this is easy to explain, and I you know, broadly think the policy implications that have been part of this, the policy responses to, uh, you know, what, to Russian policy have been correct. But I will say, in, kind of in concluding, that unanimity does carry a cost. Um, and I, I've written elsewhere about uh, other issues, the, the way in which our political uh, debate has been distorted by uh, the Trump phenomenon. That is, uh, there's a moral and political need to oppose uh, Trump, uh, but the result of this has been that everybody lines up to explain what's wrong with the Trump uh, view and less creative exploration of the prob other problems that we face. Um, and that's true of many other issues uh, besides Russia. In general, what one wants Sasha's regional experts to be able to tell you about a mysterious foreign society that it's kind of hard to figure out you know, when you ask a question about them, you know, like whether it's devaluation or, or something else that's mysterious about Russia, what you want the regional, you expect the regional experts to tell you is, well, it's complicated, right? And if we've lost anything in our view of Russia, it's, it's this view of what's complicated. 
uh, how strong is Putin? What are the divisions within the elite? What's public opinion really like? What is the significance of all that for uh, Western policy? What's happened? And I think that's what we need. We definitely need more of that, and I hope Sasha's MA students are going to, and, and I know our MA students are, <laughs> uh, are doing that, that we don't have it as a shame. Um, but I wouldn't want Putin to read Dan's book and to think that the situation we're in is anything, anyone else's fault uh, than his own. With that, let me subside. <laughs> Dan, would you like to respond a bit before we? To the, the yeah. two? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so let me start with, with Sasha. Um, I completely agree that, that in some ways the, one of the responses to the trends I'm talking about is in fact, or one of the, the last redoubts for regional studies are both the regional centers and public policy schools. Because I think public policy schools are also, you know, they're the ones granting the MAs and they're the ones who, where you can logically argue, yes, you do want a regional focus because there actually might be a demand for that, whether at the State Department or at the United Nations or at some other institution. Um, and I think you also bring up something really important, which is in some ways the, the bias in the book is I'm talking about um, people in the book who actually do want to influence public debate. And as you point out, one of the problems with the academy is that there is a large swath of the academy that has zero interest in that. And by the way, I would add that is perfectly fine. I don't think we're, we're a, the problems with the, the academy is that we are a faddish profession in the extreme. You know. It, um, we go from the point of, oh, well, no one should have a blog. A blog is awful, to now, wait, you mean you haven't published in the monkey cage yet? How come you haven't published in the monkey cage yet? That's a really bad thing to do. You totally want to get published in the monkey cage. And so my concern whenever I'm asked about this is how can Which we- Which you should want to get published. Right, in the you cage. should. Yeah, yeah, okay. But let me put it this way. I'm, very, I'm asked a lot, you know, how can we get our academic colleagues or my academic colleagues to contribute more to public debate? And, and I know a lot of my academic colleagues, and they shouldn't be contributing to public debate whatsoever. <laughs> Um, which is not to say they're not good scholars. They're extremely good scholars, but they should focus on what they're good at. Um, you know, and there are, for those who are interested, they should be able to do that, and there should carry no stigma with that. And I would actually argue that, that things have changed along that uh, front. Um, when uh, your point about, um, Sasha's point about, like, you know, we need to have develop expertise, that someone who's an undergrad only takes a couple of courses is not an expert. My problem is, is that, no, a thought leader thinks they are an expert from taking yeah. those courses. <laughs> and this is one of the problems with public debate about Russia is that, and, you know, and, uh, is that someone who thinks they're a generalist is perfectly happy and perfectly confident to go on television and say exactly what's wrong. And in some ways, in the marketplace of ideas, confidence is in and of itself an asset. I and mean, we've all been in, co in seminars where we hear someone making an argument and you're thinking, wait a minute, I know this topic. That's not right. There's no way that can be right. But they sound so confident. <laughs> Maybe they are right. Am I wrong? You know, like, and in some ways, this is the advantage that thought leaders always have in contrast to public intellectuals. Public intellectuals almost always retain some sense of skepticism, even about whether they're right. Um, whereas thought leaders, confidence is in some ways their greatest asset. Um, and this isn't just true within the academy. I think it's true, you know, more broadly than that. Um, and let me just warn you that in terms of the idea that we should teach skills, I have no problem with that. Um, but as much as the right has attacked the academy. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, and we're seeing this in polling. There is this strain of the left, think about William Derisowitz's excellent sheep, that basically argues that universities are like, you know, you know, bastions of neoliberalism, in which all we're doing is, you know, creating corporate drones that, God forbid, might actually earn a living after they graduate. Um, and in some ways, that's the real problem, that universities are facing attacks both from the right and from the left, and that's actually a, a real big problem. Um, to Stephen's points, I, you know, I don't necessarily disagree. Part of this is what Putin did, and, and part of this is due to sort of macro uh, factors. I would dispute a few of the empirics. I don't think think tanks and government are necessarily as robust as you're necessarily claiming. Indeed, one of the real problems with think tanks, particularly with respect to Russia, is accusations of corruption in terms of who's funding them. Um, and indeed, there are some think tanks that have, that have faced severe accusations along these lines. And so it might be that they're still employing people. The question is, is anyone reading what they write? Or is anyone reading what they write without saying, well, who's funding them? And therefore, can we really confidently say that this is neutral or objective analysis? Um, and that's particularly uh, problematic. 
you point out the failure of, the, of Russians to sort of cultivate the United States. And I think there's, there's a good story to tell the contrast between the way the, the Russians approached this as opposed to the way that China has approached this. And China has been brilliant about this in terms of setting up a whole welter of foundations as you know, designed mm -hmm. to bring Americans out there you know, to fund positions in the United States. I completely agree with that. It is worth pointing out, however, that you can argue that the United States failed in Russia as well. And that was despite a massive amount of NGO and civil society you know, intervention in Russia as a way of trying to sort of develop democratic uh, discourse and, and civil society norms. And instead, what wound up happening was that the Putin administration in particular thought of this as almost like a foreign body that had to be excised or purged, and that it was actually a pernicious uh, influence on their society. Um, and I think that's, that's worth pointing out. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this is that I, I completely agree that the, the, the sort of Russian foreign policy in some ways is responsible for the, the state of affairs we are now. But as we see people searching for answers to what we should do, this is where I would argue the flaws in the ideas industry that I've identified are going to make it problematic. Because the question is, who is going to be sought out to explain, well, where can we go from here? And my concern is, is that it's not going to be the people sitting here. It's going to be the Carter Pages of the world. And I think that's a little bit problematic. OK. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks to all of our panelists uh, for such um, uh, scintillating and interesting comments. I want to start off by saying, if you, if you haven't bought the book, it's really good. It's like a page turner. Um, <laughs> Which is not something we normally say about books written by academics. By the way, it's in the back. <laughs> and in it's in the back noticed. there, too. And uh, so I'm anyway. going to be signing it if you actually buy it. So right. just, just something to consider. Sorry. So the book, is, the book is great. And I, and I want to start off by just, I'm going to make a couple comments, and then, I'll, uh, then I'm going to pose a question to get us going on Q&A. But I have to say, personally, my experience of reading the book, this is the first, uh, as an academic, I'm used to, I'm excited about, I, I want to pick up books and read books where people are engaging with my scholarship and my ideas. This is the first time I've ever picked up a book where there was like, I was reading about something I had done as a person in this when all of a sudden the monkey cage pops up in the middle of this and I'm in the middle of the story and I'm reading it and everything like that. So thanks, Dan. That was a, a new experience. It gave me a new profound sense for what it feels like when we write about other people <laughs> to have them show up in their books. For those, so for those of you who don't know anything, who keep hearing us use this phrase, the monkey cage, first of all, the quote, it's from an H.L. Mencken quote, which is that politics is the art of running the circus from inside the monkey cage. That's where the name of the monkey cage came from. And what the monkey cage is, is it's a blog that um, John Sides and a few professors at George Washington University founded about 10 years ago. It was originally to try to help, and, and interestingly enough, because there's this whole chapter in this book about political science versus economics, which I was going to ask all my questions about. But oh, I'll, I'll save that for the dinner, because that may be less interesting on, <laughs> uh, for this audience. But, but one, and the founding statement of it, in part, was that economists were having, doing a very good job about getting their ideas heard in the public discourse, and political scientists were doing a terrible job of it. So the blog was formed as a format for writing about political science research in a way that people who were interested in politics but were not political scientists, did not have graduate social science degrees, could um, access the information, right? And, uh, and then it was originally about American politics and internet and society a little bit, and then after about a year after it started, a year and a half after I came on as the first comparativist on it, and it sort of grew to encompass people with uh, specialties uh, around the world. Um, and, the one comment I do want to make in regard to what Sasha said is that, and, and maybe more in line with Dan's thing, maybe not quite as far as Fed's, but I do think this battle about whether if you are an academic right, trying to do something with your research so it will be consumed more widely, I think the tide has turned on that in terms of uh, that being seen as something that is a detriment to your career, right? And, and, and that's not accidental. Like, a lot of us have worked really hard about this, have written white papers about it, have done suggestions. But I do want to say, I think there's something very positive that's happened, which is that people do put the monkey cage on their CV now. It does come up in tenure letters. The monkey cage has been cited in federal court briefs. Like, and so I do think in some ways there's a lot, there is a positive thing that's happened, which yeah. Dan, to his credit, really talks about in the book. And Ezra Klein, who's cited with these very nice quotes about it, Ezra, of course, has been, again, this is all endogenous because Ezra has been helpful in this. And Ezra was helpful in bringing us to the Washington Post, which then gave a bigger audience, which then allowed, had more people wanting to write. Yeah, Ezra brought us and then left. I didn't know that. That's <laughs> yeah. fantastic. Okay. He helped, there's a longer story there, yeah, but yeah. He, helped, he helped bring us there and then he left. Um, but, the, but there's, you know, there, 
it is, there has been success in this regard. I mean, we've now published something, the last time we counted, over 2,500 guest authors in the Monkey Jesus. Cage blog. So it has functioned as a way to give a voice for people to write about it, and people have taken advantage of this. And we've worked really hard. We go to conferences, we talk to people about how to blog. People, I've done this at ACES, I've done this at AppSet, MT, all these different places. So, but I think that that's been really positive. And so I just kind of want to sort of note that that's out there, and as much as we, and, and there's a great thing in the book where Dan talks about where, again, this was the weird thing about, like, I was talking to my wife about this, about how I was like, wow, that was me. Um, when, you know, when people, when Nick Kristoff wrote this piece saying, where are all the political scientists? And we all went on Twitter and we're like, ah, have you read anything we've written? Like, we're at the Washington Post. It's not that far away from that, you know? And so a lot of us responded to that. And, and, and I think that, so I think there is, there is some good happening. And I think there is a younger generation. I mean, we have untenured faculty who are now editors at the monkey cage. This would have been inconceivable even five years ago, right? So I think the, the, some doors have been turned and I think the attitudes about it. Are there still you know, professors in academic departments who will look askance when they hear that their colleagues might want to write for a blog? Sure. Is it the dominant strand? No, it's not the dominant strand anymore in political science. So that's been exciting and I think that's an important thing that I just want to throw out in this discussion. However, I'm going to ask a different question, um, which is, again, building off of something that Sasha said in her point, which is that was the thing that I wanted to leave with, which there was this, you know, aftermath of Crimea, this big public outcry. I think Mike had a piece, Mike was quoted in a piece, somebody wrote it, maybe, Steve, did you write it? Somebody wrote it in the New York Times, there was a big op-ed about this lack of Russia expertise and how important it was to get more Russia expertise. It was a, it was a press story, I remember it was like a news story. It was a news but story, Mike, Mike was quoted, quoted in it. there were a bunch of people yeah. quoted it, Mike McFall at Stanford, former U.S. ambassador at Russia. Um, as a sign, of course, of how academics don't engage in the broader <laughs> policy world, right? Um, a political science professor who became the ambassador of Russia. Uh, so then, so, so there's this call for training more Russia experts. Everyone on this ta in this table here, you know, we think this is important. We want better expertise about Russia. The Jordan Center at NYU, you know, the whole stated goal of the Jordan Center is to support and publicize high quality research on Russia to get it out there, to help experts who are doing work, who are spending seven years learning about topics, give them a forum where they can talk about the work, where we can put it online, where people can watch it online, where it can be archived, where we can have, you know, share these sorts of things. The question I wanna raise, I think, is the other elephant in the room here. Uh, or perhaps it's not one elephant, but thousands of little mechanical elephants, which is that I spent today uh, editing two, uh, proofreading actually, two forthcoming articles that we have out of my lab at NYU about bots in Russian Twitter. And the question that I want to raise is, um, which is that I, it was just to push this discussion in the other, into the direction of the other big discussion that's going on all over the place right now, which is whether we're entering into a kind of post-truth society. Are we hitting the point, so Dan's thing is sort of about, there's this rise of these issue experts, the rise of the thought leaders, right? Versus the old public intellectuals, and they're dueling it out for influence on ideas. But are we entering a point where actually both of these groups may come to become less relevant moving forward. Are we getting to the point where we're getting a clips where it's becoming easier and easier for anyone to enter ideas into the public discourse? And the connection between what link those ideas have to anything that's true at all is growing more and more tenuous. So has social media, in a sense, by f providing the tools by which people who hold you know, whatever attitudes there are out there, can find each other, can come together, can work to promulgate those ideas, to produce content, right, which will now be in the media, eco media ecosystem, to harness tools like bots and trolls to amplify that content, and to enter that into the debate. So, in a sense, will both public intellectuals, and th my question is, will both public intellectuals and thought leaders be overwhelmed by something else in the, in the near future? Is it happening already, right? And then, based on all the arguments you have in the book, right? So on the one hand, is that bad? If thought leaders are, in a sense, a product of plutocrats, then allowing ideas to enter the public discourse that don't have the support of plutocrats seems like not a bad idea. On the other hand, if part of what's happening here is that this is a tool where real ide ideas really far outside the mainstream, which we might call anti-systemic or illiberal ideas, are able to enter the public discourse and are able to play the old public intellectual role of being the curmudgeon of badgering things, but they can play it with any scientific fact. They can put out, roll out 
any kind of opposition to saying, oh, you think you know this about the way the world works? No, the world doesn't work this way. Look, we have a photo with a, with a meme on it, and look, it's being spread all over the place, right? And now that's something that people can glom onto instead. So maybe this is, you know, is this problematic in this regard? So I guess the big, the big sort of question in here is, if we're able to solve this problem of getting more experts that Sasha rises, rises, more expertise on Russia in the coming years, how can we ensure, right, or how worried should we be that they'll even be heard in the first place? Okay. Um, uh, I think the answer is Let's we should be a little worried. Yep. Uh, I mean, the quick answer is you should be a little worried. Um, because, as I said, one of the, the pro but I don't think this is because the sort of bot phenomenon is somehow separate from, from the sort of marketplace ideas that I talked about before. Indeed, in some ways, there are, you know, you just described the alt-right in terms of what's going on. And the alt-right, God help me, is someone like Steve Bannon or Milo qualifies, unfortunately, as a thought leader in the sense of they've got this one big idea that they think explains everything. Um, and indeed, delight in sort of, you know, being so provocative that it, you know, forces public intellectuals into sort of an inco in incoherent rage in some ways and potentially weakens them. Um, that's the negative side. And, indeed, and let me put it this way. The, the, there's an old debate from going back to John Stuart Mill about the notion that we want to have a vital debate. We, you know, the, the worst thing in Mill's mind was the notion that something becomes accepted as, as given, that then it becomes dead dogma. And as a result, we don't understand why it was you know, thought to be true. And so as a result, we're bad at arguing it. And you can argue that in some ways, what's happening right now is the rise of these kinds of extremist voices are actually forcing people to articulate things that had been accepted as given for so long that in some ways we almost forgot or thought the argument in favor of them was so banal that we're out of practice in terms of making it. So there is a weird way in which I would argue that Donald Trump is going to make public intellectuals great again. Um, because he's actually forcing a lot of experts to, you know, again, to articulate again and again things like tax cuts won't pay for themselves necessarily. Or, yes, we might want good relations with Russia, but Russia can't provide us certain things. You know, Russia's not necessarily going to give us all that much. Or there is, in fact, a purpose for NATO. Um, you know, that, that even if, you know, the European members don't contribute more than 2% of GDP, there is still value in having that institution. Um, and indeed, there, there is a whole panoply of ways in which the Trump administration has tried to put forward a policy or Trump has tried to tweet something, you know, and then has had to face a tsunami of, of expertise, and, you know, whether it's coming from journalism or think tanks or the academy saying, you're just wrong, you know, that this is what you're saying is not necessarily true. And he might still manage to insist that he's actually true, but I don't know if he's actually winning the arguments. He's in power, and there are certainly ways in which that, you know, he'll be able to implement policy in that way. But I don't think he's winning the larger public debate. As you point, you know, as, as Stephen pointed out, it is interesting to me to see that you haven't suddenly saw Republicans wholeheartedly embrace Russia in the same way that, that Trump has. There's been movement but the movement's been relatively modest, which in fact does suggest that there are certain hard limits on a sort of post-truth argument because it's not, it's simply not gonna sell. Yeah. Alexander? Yeah, I, I would say also that, um, you know, in a way it's a new form of competition, right? And if we believe that competition is actually making things better in some way, even though none of us likes it, right? That it, it forces people to raise their game. And one of the effects of that is that it probably forces public intellectuals and thought leaders to concentrate more on marketing and yeah. on the content management of what they're doing, right? It's not just enough to write an article or to write a blog right. post. It's what you do with that to make sure that it actually gets right. disseminated and distributed in a way that at least can, can compete more with the bots. Not with, exactly with the bots, but can at least do something. Um, the other point I would make is that in terms of, of the fake news phenomenon, which is so hard to, um, to deal with, that Fake news is, is driven by commercial interests more than political interests, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the extremely complicated um, ecosystem behind digital advertising, which is very difficult to figure out, a lot of it is about making money because of clicks and because of you know, the impressions that someone shows up on the screen. And I think we still need a lot more work to understand how that ecosystem works and how to counter it. Because just saying something is fake news obviously is not enough to, to cut it off. I, just a, I think you're, you're right about that, and I think one of the more interesting phenomena going forward is going to be the increasing political attention on the sort of big tech 
-hmm. as, as the fact that they are no longer, you know, that they're described as social media, but increasingly they are information providers. And so as a result, the question becomes how do you regulate them in such a way or how do you put pressure on them in such a way that they help to, you know, they be part of the solution rather than part of the problem on this? Steve? Just a quick extra comment. I, I agree with uh, uh, Dan's view that, you know, there's uh, the, the, story, the end of the story isn't, uh, isn't told yet and, and the pushback against Trump may be as significant as, uh, uh, as anything we've, we've seen. That, but I don't think it's just a case of uh, kind of dusting off old arguments and, uh, and making them better. I think in some ways it involves a kind of reversal of, uh, of positions. You know, in the academy, we've gotten used to saying that truth is just socially constructed, right? And uh, now uh, it's uh, it's you know it's the uh, it's the anti-elite position to say that uh, truth is socially constructed. I, I think truth is going to become an elite value, <laughs> and uh, it's a, uh, a, a and what you may end up with is uh, you know a more divided um, marketplace. Uh, in which the uh, you know the whole idea of uh, of truth is itself a kind of contested question. Brett Stevens has an, a piece in the Times today which is exactly makes exactly that point. He says, you know, to understand Putin and the debate about Russia and and what to understand Trump, you just have to read Peter Pomerantsev's book. And uh, I think there is, um, you know, there is. It's, it's worth keeping in mind that what we're talking about here is not just regional expertise and policy outcomes, but uh, sort of bigger questions than that about uh, understanding uh, reality. You could say that's the uh, that's one of the big sub uh, you know subcurrents right. in uh, in contemporary political debate. Uh, let me. I, I want, want to take up this issue of. Um, plutocrats and the ideas industry and actually link it to Russia. Now, as we know, in Russia, there are a number of quite wealthy um, gentlemen, almost exclusively gentlemen, in terms of who the oligarchs are. Uh, and many of them are now moving into you know, somewhat of a philanthropic um, space. Um, they do charity, they do different kinds of sort of fundings, and actually, Oxford University accepted quite a sizable gift. Don't quote me exactly. Was it 70 million pounds, 80 million pounds from Lem Blavatnik yeah, to create the Blavatnik School? Mm -hmm. One of the professors at the Blavatnik School, Bo Rothstein, a noted professor of um, political economy, um, publicly quit this fall um, and uh, made the statement that um, to him it was antithetical to the mission of the school on uh, governance to be part of um, a public policy school whose donor was so tied to Trump. So I, without, if, if you'd like to comment on that specific episode, go right ahead. But one of the, uh, one of the really interesting parts of this that sort of strikes me is why don't we have more Russian funding, right, of public policy institutions? There's, <laughs> there's some exceptions here. But I think that's quite interesting. And I think Steve's point about sort of China and sort of the Confucian centers really, um, really contrasts to the lack, I would say, of open endowments in Russian-related sort of studies and, and, and fields of affairs. I mean, we can count them on our, on our hands, where sort of China, so many. Middle East, so many. Um, so I would appreciate if anyone can enlighten me on that. So um, we were looking for a long time at opening a Harvard office in Moscow um, until Crimea sort of made, uh, and sanctions made it politically difficult. And our idea was to raise money from Russians who would be interested in having a Harvard office in Moscow, uh, not only facilitating research from our professors, but also allowing uh, students who were potentially interested in attending Harvard to get more information on admissions and all sorts of things. 
Um, and every time we went to go talk to a potential Russian donor, they said, well, you're just going to do physics, right? <laughs> and I said, well, I can't control what our professors are going to study. And they said, well, no one's going to study elections, are they? <laughs> I said, well, they might. And they said, well, count me off. Right. Right? right. No one wants to be putting money into something that potentially creates blowback that then puts them in trouble with Putin. And that's true not only for the Russians in Russia, but all the Russians, or most of the Russians outside of Russia, who still have assets or family or an idea that they might want to go back. They're just not willing to risk it. Good. I'm convinced. OK. <laughs> um, let's open this up. A very oh. interesting uh, issue to watch is yeah. whether, at what point, that changes a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because it will be a real sign that the Putin system is unraveling. Yeah. But it also might be too late. I mean, if, if, imagine for a moment if a Russian plutocrat now tried to, to do this sort of thing. I would be very interested to see what the blowback would be in, you know, on an American campus or in a think tank if you suddenly saw a like a Blavatnik-style endowment. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I'm saying it, it, in some ways it's, it's almost, I wonder if the, the, the barn door has already been opened in that sense. Okay, let's open it up and then we'll carry on conversations here. Just a reminder, you are being streamed, you're on the record, so please introduce yourself and your institutional affiliation. You have your question, yeah. And wait for the mic, yeah. Test it, okay. Hi, I'm Alexis Lerner and I am a visiting scholar here at Harriman. Though my home department, I'm doing my doctorate at the University of Toronto. Uh, and full disclosure, I work for the Stanford US-Russia Forum. So just to make that. So anyway, I just got back from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow, and, and I think a lot of what I heard from the cybersecurity director there that I sp with whom I spoke uh, was similar to what I hear Stephen saying, which, which my own optimism, maybe I, I disagree because I'm too optimistic, but I, I heard the same ideas that US and Russia, there's not a lot of future for them to be strategic partners. And so, but you, then you see these regional initiatives like that between the state of California and the, and the Tumen region. So you, you have all these other projects going on. And I want to know, you know, Dan, at the start you mentioned uh, track two or perhaps track 1.5 diplomacy. So what is the role of us in academia or young scholars or, or established scholars in this sort of track two conversation? And how do we train, perhaps this question is for others, how do we train our, our young scholars to join this conversation that doesn't take place sort of in the, in the hallowed halls? Um, so, you know, it's funny. Uh, it was two weeks ago that as part of the Carnegie uh, grant that I, I oversee, we just had a conference at uh, Fletcher, an all-day conference involving um, Fletcher School participants uh, a whole variety of American uh, academics and, and international academics, and scholars from MGIMO, uh, from the Russian Foreign Ministry, which I thought actually went extremely well. And I think one of the reasons it went extremely well is that um, we structured it so that, frankly, the conference was, was an airing of grievances, as it were, which is to say, I think one of the, the mistakes that's sometimes made in terms of track two diplomacy is the belief of, well, you know, there are these issues that we, we maybe have some, some commonalities for. And what we should do is, is focus on those issues. And then once we build up trust there, it'll spill over, like let's say the Arctic or something. And then, you know, it'll, it'll be greater after that. Um, I actually don't think that, I, I, it, this might be unique to the Russians, but I certainly don't think that's how the Russians view it. And I don't think it's how we should view it either. I mean, I think what we need to do is have a more frank conversation. Occasionally, you know, maybe the occasional screaming match, but at least where we potentially articulate where each side is coming from. I mean, in my experience, I don't have nearly as much Russia experience as, as anyone else here at the table, but you know, I've gone to Valdai, I've gone to a couple of fora, I've, I've sort of seen the Russian position, and the thing to realize about the Russian position is that there is at least enough of a grain of truth in what they're saying so that you can't dismiss it. And so I think it's by getting exposed to that that you learn how can you, you know, you know, who do you respect over there? Who is worth talking to? And it's not like it's necessarily going to automatically lead to, to a greater understanding down the road. In some ways, this is partly about my old dean at, at Fletcher, Steve Bosworth, was a diplomat, and he talked about the, the notion of ripeness, which is to say there has to be a moment where conditions are right or ripe such that if you want to foster a stronger relationship or you want to take action, that's when you have to do it. And I think in some ways, you almost have to think about this as tilling and fertilizing the soil so that you have you know, enough of a dense network of relationships so that if there is actually a sort of macro shift, you can then take advantage of it very quickly. I don't think from track two alone, you're going to have automatically you know, that flowering. That's not how it works. 
But what you can do is make sure the soil isn't so barren so that if conditions change, you know, you can immediately take advantage of it. Can I add one? Yeah, thing please. Uh, I'll, I'll describe without boring you with the, the details an exchange that I had with a young Russian scholar at a, uh, an event not so different from what Dan is describing uh, this summer. And this young guy, very smart, capable, um, presented a kind of Russian line, Russian government line, on a subject where I thought it was completely ridiculous. And I, so in my, I had, I would have been a presenter, and I, so in my conclusion, I kind of pinned his ears back. And I said, look, come on, just think about what that sounds like. And I explained the, you know, it didn't really make any sense. And I felt I'd been a little rough on him. So being a good guy, <laughs> I went up to him afterwards, meaning to say, you know, really, it's OK. Let's have a drink. We'll you know, talk it over a little further. And as I approached, he said, I agree with you totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just wasn't safe for him to say what he really thought. And I was struck in the rest of this conversation by how many people I knew were not saying what I knew they thought. And so while I agree with Dan about creating forums in which people can air grievances, I think it's also important to understand they may not believe what they're saying and that we ought to be kind of you know, preserving tr elite truth as an elite value <laughs> so that we don't think it's that they're, if we don't think their view is completely sensible or, or, or even remotely sensible or even ridiculous, we should say so. And their respectability should depend a little bit on uh, whether we can be persuaded that they're actually saying what they believe. Because I am afraid, and I, and I think the encouragement of it would be another leading indicator of the unraveling of the Putin regime. You know, the people feel freer to say what they think. Because that isn't really the case now, unfortunately. It's one of the things that makes going to Moscow kind of frustrating. You just hear so much rote repetition of views that, you know, people who were your friends in the past who told you something totally different, you know, do not believe what they're saying. That is, you know, it's a kind of tragic development. The, the other thing I think that is important to take advantage of when the opportunity presents itself is for scholars to do what scholars do well, which is get together and discuss research, right? Now, it's great to have these four to discuss other things, but Carnegie, the same grant that's supporting this actual uh, lecture series that we've been doing, it's also part of the money that Columbia got from Carnegie is being used to support <coughs> conferences that involve getting graduate students together from Columbia and other universities in the area, including NYU, with Russian PhD students. And we've had conferences here at Columbia. We've had conferences at the Higher School of Economics. And these kinds of you know scholar to scholar context, I mean, this, this has an antecedent going back quite a long time. And so I think that's a simple thing that people can do. And to the extent that this is things we can think about when we're setting up trying to do this, but you know, trying to reach out to other scholars and trying to at things like Slavic study you know, associations and things like that. So I think that's it's not going to be the big picture stuff of talking about the kind of things. It's not track 1.5. It's not even track 2. But it's, you know, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the fertile soil aspect of it, I think, you know, it's a much better situation where young scholars who are studying Russia know young Russian scholars who are interested in similar topics um, than the opposite. I, I don't know if I'd say it's so easy, right, to find. I'm um, not saying it's easy. I just okay. said take advantage of it <laughs> okay. when the, take advantage yeah. of it when the opportunities come along. If Stanford has this program that's doing that, that's a good thing to do. Here, you know, when we make when people are making opportunities available to students in the New York area, it's great that they can do that. Yeah. No. I th I'm sorry. No, no, go, 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 a quick go. thing that, that I think it's it's incredibly important to be engaging Russian scholars. Um, they're not necessarily in universities, right? But but academically thinking Russians in the conversation. One of the problems, though, is that um, the, the pool of people that we talk to is pretty narrow. And I should mention, sorry, that Alexander is one of the organizers and 
uh, has headed for many, many years the um, working group on uh, U.S.-Russia, uh, future the future of, of U.S.-Russia US relations. So yes. she's seen the trajectory of this pool and also dealt with different topics and different highs and lows and so forth. So, so this is also yeah. a Carnegie-funded project. Yep. Um, and uh, it basically, we started it in 2010. We were going to get at the, the real issues underlying the problems in U.S.-Russia relations by talking about areas where there were common areas of co cooperation. We did the Arctic. We did the Pacific, we did arms control, we did everything. And after 2014, we basically have um, six month sessions every six months of airing of grievances. Yeah. Um, in fact, we're going there next week, Alex and I, to talk about the 1990s and how, how bad everything was, well, like from fun. the Russian perspective. Um, and we're kind of, uh, we're always looking to bring in new people that we can engage in the discussion. But first of all, as Steve said, the Russians are very paranoid about talking. So they really only talk openly when they're out of Russia, but they can't come to the US anymore because that's seen as making a political statement that you're pro-American uh, and the Americans are against the Russians. So it becomes more and more complicated to actually have the basic track two discussions, which are important for all of the reasons yeah. that Dan has stated. Great. Let's get, please, Tim. Hi, I'm Tintin Chaparit. I am a student here at Columbia. Um, I have a question for you as a student and someone who is hoping to become a Russia expert down the line. Um, a problem that I've encountered that some of my peers have also encountered is that um, programs like the Harriman, um, like the program on US-Russia relations, um, that have try to invite those with opposing views to come to speak to us, the students. And there is tremendous effort on Harriman's and other programs part where they actually try to get those people to talk to us, but us, the students, are not very happy to hear opposing views. And how do we then, and, and what happens is I have seen this uh, without naming any names, whereby students have then gone to our faculty to complain. Why did you invite so-and-so? Do we really need to listen to this? Excuse my French, BS. Um, if we are trying to become Russia experts, isn't it healthy to, number one, help us to build up a stamina to listen to opposing views that we disagree with, but at least it's not on TV, it's actually in the room where we can at least try to challenge them? even though they might not respond because they have a, a line that they have to abide by. And two, if we are then going to go to the next level and try to become diplomats, isn't it very undiplomatic to walk out of the room when somebody's saying something that we disagree with? So in essence, my question is how do we, the students, build up the stamina to be able to take on this opportunity that our faculty and our directors such as Professor Cooley are giving us to actually hear something that we might disagree with without saying, well, why did you invite so-and-so? They are not talking anything that is sensible. Thank you. Um, so I have a little spiel that I always give when I start teaching classes. I, I, so the, the quick answer I will give you is that this can't just be a question of what speakers you bring in. It's also got to be how professors run their own classrooms pedagogically. So I have a little spiel that I always do for all of my classes, you know, at the, the first day when they walk in and I say, look, I just want to make this clear at the outset that if I say something that, you know, you think is triggering in some way or that, you know, offends your core beliefs, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I really don't. Because if that's what you're concerned about, then don't come to university. All right, if your core beliefs aren't challenged at least once, in graduate school, then you've gone to the you've done the wrong you've gone to the wrong place. The whole point of this is being exposed to different points of view and not retreating from it, but figuring out well why do I dislike this? Is this wrong? What's the value of the argument? And you know, part of being a professor is, and I'm you know I'm not saying anything that any people on this table don't know is, you know, it, this is actually an interesting and tricky phenomenon in the world of social media. But one of the things you do as a professor is you play devil's advocate. If you're you know if you have a seminar and all your students are like. Uh, I don't know, I think Huntington's wrong on this whole clash of civilizations thing. You're going to make the argument, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Maybe Huntington's got all, you know, a, a decent couple of points to make here, even if personally you might not necessarily agree with that. Um, although that raises an interesting challenge related to the book, which is what happens if you have a public profile that your students then also know about? And this right. is something I have yeah. never been able to right. reconcile, which is how, as a per, you know, this, it's one thing to be a professor in a classroom, and try to be sort of the neutral arbiter, try to play right. the devil's advocate. But if these people have read what I've written, they know exactly where I stand on certain things. And some, I've never been able to reconcile. 
Yeah, I've been talking about that a lot. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I would just want to jump in on this because we I was just discussing this at um, at lunch today with a number of colleagues. I mean, I think this is a larger question about that is an important question about what's happening. I mean, I, I guess in one way, your question, while framed in terms of Russia discussion, it's a much more general question. And I think that this is a much larger question that's taking place on college campuses right now. And I mean, I am very clear in my position on this, which is that we need to preserve universities as a place where ideas are questioned and that universities have a special role in society for this. It's part of why we have nonprofit status. It's all sorts of other things, but it's where ideas are held. That being said, there's a huge, you know, there are pressures coming, and I think this goes back to Dan's point about universities being under attack from both the right and the left. There are pressures from both directions, right, and depending on which campus you are, where, where the directions are coming from more, but about, about trying, to, um, trying to have greater prescriptions on who's allowed to speak at universities and what they're allowed to say when they're there. And this is a real debate, and people are having it, and there are real feelings on this. And I think there are generational differences on this quite as well. And I think it's our responsibility as professors, even when it's uncomfortable, to sort of stand up for those core values. Now, you know, then that leads to another question, right? If you're going to bring in an unpopular speaker who doesn't have views, how do you get people to show up and listen to the unpopular speaker? Well, that's a whole other matter entirely. And I don't think that's the, the core of what this debate has been about. This debate has mainly been about certain people on campuses wanting to bring certain people in and other people not wanting that person to speak. Although I will say, you know, that this, this, you know, this came home to root recently at Middlebury College where a colleague yep. of ours was caught in the middle of this in a very physical and violent way. Um, and so there are there are real ramifications of this, but it's it's encouraging to hear you talking about it, and it's good to hear that people who are thinking about this from the student perspective as well. And you know, we're trying to be supportive of getting diversity of views, but you know, it it can be difficult. And that goes back to the question about Russia, when you end up having a situation where there's such consensus. You know, there's not really, a, I mean, going back to Russia in the 2016 election, it's not like there's two sides of this argument where people are like. Uh, it's a bad thing that Russia intervened in the 2016 U.S. elections. And then there are other people being like, no, 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 it's totally a good thing that <laughs> Russia intervened in the 2016 elections. There are people who say, like, it's hypocritical of the U.S. to criticize Russia for intervening in the 2016 election, given our history of doing it. There are other people who will say, where's the evidence that Russia intervened right. in the 2016 election? But those are kind of orthogonal debates that aren't debates on the sort of core of the issue. So sometimes it could be tricky and, you know, to, to come yeah. up with these things. Let me say just one more thing to, to enrich this as a regional studies debate. Uh, what, what I've noticed during my post-Crimea tenure here um, at Harriman, it, it, it seems to make a difference um, how much of the region you cover, right? So for us, Ukraine is in, right? And that's been the case since the 90s. Everyone's in. The Stands are in. The Caucasus are in. Mongolia's in. The Balkans are in. East Europe is in, right? So we're maximalist. Um, but that actually doesn't give us the option of not taking it on when there's war, right? And so, you know, we hold a lot of different types of events. Most events we get some blowback on, right? We get some disgruntled emails, oh my gosh, that was so biased, why did you have that speaker, and so forth. Um, but, you know, my instinctive reaction um, is always, you know, you know, to hear them out, to see if they have the point, and then look at the event programming over the course of 150 events that we do over the year. And I say, you know, judge us by the totality of the event. Have we covered enough angles on Ukraine, right, over the course of an academic year, as opposed to insisting on a cable news type format in any one single panel, right, or in any one single uh, kind of debate. That we can't do. In part because, you know, getting back to one of Dan's point, I want to preserve the academy and sometimes doing something that's hyper-specialized, that appeals to the eight people who are really interested in Kyrgyz educational policy in the 1960s. True speaker, right? Um, um, you know, we can't have everything. You got eight people to go to that? That's, <laughs> wow. That, you, you're, you're better as a director than I really yeah. you, you should have heard the con speaker on that. that that's right. That's right. That's right. So, 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 so that, I think, is, brings about a particular flavor. I mean, at Davis, Ukraine is an affiliate, but it's not really in. You guys do Russia. Maybe you do some Ukraine or Russian perspective on Ukraine. So, so that's, that's a part of this, too, um, that we can't sort of um, um, lose sight of. Okay, what I'd like to do is just take um, just a final group of questions, and we'll go down the panel one last time and just um, keep them brief so we can cram in a basket. Yes, sir. 
Yep. I'm a member of the public. <laughs> uh, is this the proper forum for me to mention the name of a very prominent Kremlinologist and talking head and ask you um, which category he fits into and uh, what interests he represents? And I'm referring to Professor Emeritus at Princeton and NYU, Stephen Cohen. Okay, thank you. Jan in the back. Hi, thanks so much. My name is Jana Garhovska. I'm a, a Harriman postdoc working um, as part of this, this program. And so my question was, um, how, have, how have academics, if you could maybe comment on how academics have reacted to this, um, this erosion of, of trust and authority, um, and then what I sometimes observe on social media is that Academics will criticize others who want to express an opinion about Russia for having a lack of expertise, and there's this territorialism mm. that, that mm. happens, right? When a journalist writes an op-ed piece, um, you know, they can experience some pretty serious uh, blowback. Um, we had a lot of fun with, you know, uh, Dr. Gorka's uh, supposed PhD. Mm. Um, so we take apart other people who offer kind of opinions on who, who, who have the nerve to get kind of onto our territory. And I wonder if this is a natural progression of, um, you know, the erosion of public trust and authority and then academics' reaction to that erosion. Great question. Um, and let's take two here. Yep. Yep. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Olga Kostunova, Institute of Modern Russia. Um, my question is about uh, the Russia coverage by the mainstream media. What is your assessment of it? Great, thank you for that. Yep, and right next. Michael Petrovsky, now I'm a research analyst. Uh, I work, one question to panelists. Yes, one question. I worked a lot of uh, in nuclear energy, in oil, gas, uh, in Russia, road regulations, in the Russian Union. And when I came to the United States this year with a line extraordinary liability visa, I found an interesting thing with institutes here for uh, Fellowship, you have a fellowship for young uh, scholar, five or three years. And my question, whether USA is really interested in uh, this topic, Russia and Russia, or experience, or it's only to feed, to support young scientists. So uh, this is a question to the public. Uh, if we decided, for example, we like to, you need to make surgery <coughs> and you need to be operated, what do you like? Experience or younger who use another material? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, so panel. Um, oh, and Elizabeth, please. Just wait for them. Now, I would like to expand a little on your question and how would you evaluate? Expertise is not neutral, obviously. So uh, take Schulman as against pipes. And I can cite, because of my own age, so older experts. And I would like to know your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so let's go in. Oh. Can you just say what Elizabeth's question was? I just didn't hear it. I think it was an expansion on the Stephen Cohen question. Expansion of okay. Stephen Cohen and expertise and Richard the Marshall Parsons Shulman type, 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 type role. OK, shall we go in the order of the panelists and for final thoughts? Like, yeah. so Dan? You, yep. OK. Um, I'm not going to touch the Russia experts in terms of how I would categorize them because I, I really do. I'm, I'm going to defer to you guys on that, and I, I won't do that. Um, I do think that is it, Yanka, um, yeah. Yana. Uh, the question about academics and sort of dealing with with those who might not have a PhD, and so you look down on them and so forth. I think that's a fair point. Although I here there's a spectrum. I don't know if, and I think partly, you know, as someone who observe social media, I do think there is without question a tendency of academics sometimes to try to be sort of snooty. And I think this is particularly true. One of the problems is when, and this goes to the age issue, is when someone who is venerated within the academy tries to wade into this sort of new online debate and discover that they're not necessarily treated the same way online as they are in a seminar room where there are graduate students and undergraduates that are beholden to them for a whole variety of reasons and that respect them for a whole variety of reasons. So partly there's a shock effect. Now, to be fair, I think some people have, have once you get through that initial passage, 
and you learn how things are going, I think it, it works reasonably well. But Gorka is an interesting case, um, and I could just go to town on this, but, um, but, but I will say this. I, I think the, the hostility to Gorka was not based on the notion that he – it was based on the notion that Gorka himself was not putting himself up as someone who – you know, was just an ordinary citizen and, and thought he could have contribute something to the, the public sphere. Gorka was someone who radiated the, the belief that he was a distinguished PhD who knew everything about counterterrorism when he didn't speak Arabic. So in some ways, Gorka is just, I mean, he's like a grade Z Bond villain that you just want to like, it, it's fun to pick on him. It really is. I mean, it's embarrassing to admit, but he's such a, a, an extreme caricature of you know, a an overinflated ego trying to masquerade as an expert that really you can't just help but point and laugh, and I grant you that might not necessarily expose our best side, um, but on the other hand he does bring this out because he thinks that we're all worthless as well. I mean you know, and and so in some sense it, it becomes a chicken and egg paradox, which is how do you deal with someone that silly, um, in in public debate, um, and then uh, in terms of the to Olga's question about Russian coverage, uh, you know. And, mainstream media, I'm going to quickly, you know, my, my impression is I'm pretty happy with what I consume, but this might be also because I trust the sources that I'm reading. So, you know, as much as we might talk about BuzzFeed, Miriam Elder knows what the hell she's talking about when it comes to Russia. You know, Julia Yaffe, if she's going to write about this in The Atlantic, I trust her. Masha Gessen is incredible when it comes to this sort of stuff. Um, and, and so I, I do think there's a lot of really good, you know, MSM coverage on this. The problem comes when others start to weigh in, either on cable television or reporters that are not necessarily, uh, or pundits that are not necessarily familiar with the subject. And so, in some ways, I think it's who do you, if, if you start consuming this stuff, you quickly very, you, you learn very quickly who do you trust and who do you not. The problem is, is that you're an expert. You know, I'm a, dis, you know, I'd like to think I'm relatively discerning on this. It, 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 the question is like. Does my father, who is a retired surgeon, by the way, um, who doesn't necessarily know all that much, if he calls me up and says, hey, you know, there's this really interesting op-ed in the New York Times that you should read, and I know it's a piece of crap, that's when I realize, you realize there's a problem. And that I don't have an answer for. Alexander? Now, I would agree with Dan that the question is, you know, which journalist do you trust, not do you trust the entire mainstream media? Yeah. Um, and the ones that Dan has listed are excellent, and, and there are certain aggregators that pull out the best pieces, like the Center for Global Interests, which sends something out every day with kind of the, the best articles on Russia. Um, in terms of the question on, on whether or not we only want young people, I mean, I would say that universities are generally teaching young people because students tend to be younger. Um, at the Davis Center, we usually have 15 to 20 visitors a year from all over mm -hmm. the former Soviet Union. And we can fund three of them. They're, those are postdocs. They're people who've just received their PhDs. Fellowship. And, but the fellowships, if you're older, we kind of assume that you have the money to come on your own. And we welcome a lot of people with their own funding. Either they've won grants or they can fund it, as long as they have an academic project and they're doing research. That we, we don't discriminate on the basis of age. And I would say, actually, the average age of our fellows right now is probably about 40, because we have a couple near retirement, but still very productive. <laughs> Um, well, let me just say a, a nice word about Steve Cohen, uh, who is a, a <clears throat> brilliant scholar who made some important uh, contributions to uh, Russian and Soviet history, uh, whose policy views I tend to find uh, wrongheaded, but uh, you know, that's, that's what make politics. Um, and uh, I, I do, th sorry? Uh, not in any way that would be especially um, <laughs> uh, illuminating. Uh, you know, I, I th yeah. <laughs> I think I, I won't. Um, I, I will say that, um, You know, if you haven't read his book on Bukharin, you should. It's really a terrific book. And uh, whenever I 
get rather heated in my disagreements with him on policy issues. And, you know, and, and they get to some sort of fundamental things. Steve and I have been disagreeing on television for 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure he's, if we ran the tape, we would find some things that he got right and that others that he got wrong. Um, but, uh, so you know. Yeah, let's, yeah, no. we're running out of time here. So I, I think that's, uh, that's not right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the fact that you write a terrific book doesn't mean that your views on policy uh, are any more, uh, you know, are any better founded than those of somebody who, you know, hasn't written as good a book. Um, about the mainstream media, I think it's really an important uh, question because I, I have always thought that our leading newspapers uh, have terrific coverage uh, by the reporters that they send to uh, Russia. Uh, and I mean, in, I mean, there's slightly fewer um, newspapers represented there, but the, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, uh, and, a, and a few others have retained, have always sent their best people, and they, uh, you know, you could, you could, you know, most of them get the equivalent of graduate degrees in the work that they do there. Um, they do, of course, any journalist will tell you this, uh, face the competition to get on the front page, uh, to get published in print and not just online. And sometimes that they will tell you that kind of, you know, pushes them to try to identify subjects that are more sensational, that will get the editor's eye back home. Uh, but I think that's a relatively minor thing. News newspaper journalism on Russia is just outstanding. Where you see a, a, you know, something different is, uh, I think both Dan and Sasha have said, is, it, you know, on, on television. Uh, because there, uh, the premium on controversy and on, you know, having food fights uh, is uh, is great, or or the premium on you know, uh, kind of bashing the uh, the opponent of how it, depending on which network you're on, um, you know. At a certain point last summer, I just got tired of being on the screen with you know five different boxes of heads of experts, and I just told the people, you know, the next time you want to have me on to talk about you know some problem where even if we're kind of at a table and we're just talk, talking about it, that's fine, but I'm not doing five boxes uh, again. And it, I don't think anybody learns anything from it. Um, I, I just you. wanted to close one thing. You know, one other way in which the media matters, and this connects to the academy, is that in some ways the greatest influence that uh, an academic might have in the public sphere is not if they write an op-ed or if they publish a book, but literally, are they on a reporter's Rolodex? Or I, yeah. I, it shows how old I am that I said the word Rolodex. <laughs> if they're on the speed, you know, the, the smartphone, um, when a reporter <laughs> needs up. to write a story and actually get the uh, get the expert comment, and I think one of the one of the things that senior scholars need to start doing, or you know, that I've learned that to do, is that if someone calls me to ask about a comment about a particular thing, and I don't think I'm really enough of an expert. It's taken me a long time to realize I don't have to comment. Um, but more importantly, to then give them yep. the three or four names, hopefully of junior people, Absolutely. that you should talk to that will actually know this stuff. And really, all it takes is one quote, one good quote, and suddenly they're in the speed, you know, on the cell phone as well. <laughs> I don't even know what the hell I'm saying on that point. Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, just to make two quick comments on this. Um, one thing uh, about, uh, just to follow up a moment ago, about what that we've tried to do with these New York City Russia public policy series is that we've tried to get some of these top Russia journalists on panels with academics. And so we've done this with our panel on Russia in the 2016 elections. We had Julia Yaffe was part of that panel. We did that with our panel on Compromat, uh, 
where we brought Miriam Elder in. And, but in both cases, it wasn't come out and just hear the journalists talk, although we, of course, do these kinds of things. But we were trying to encourage this dialogue. Yeah. So that's one thing we've been trying to do with this forum. So I encourage you, again, to sort of keep an eye on that, where it's something we, we, we're, we're very proud of and we think has been, has been great and has really led to interesting exchanges of harnessing different, different types of specialties talking to each other. I just wanted to make one quick question about the expertise and how people respond to expertise. And it has been, as someone who's been, you know, a little bit a part of and watching the kind of academic Twitter develop, it's been very interesting to kind of watch it and be in the middle of it a little bit, not nearly to the extent that Dan is. But I will say there's one, there is something weird about being a political scientist. So I have friends who are academics in other fields. And like, I don't feel like my friends who are, who are experts on Chekhov have a lot of people coming and telling them they know Chekhov better. <laughs> and people don't get on social media and say, oh, you're doing protein folding? Let me tell you how proteins fold. <laughs> but everybody thinks they know something about politics. And yeah. there is an entire industry of people, political consultants, who are paid to tell people things about politics. So part of the evolution of the monkey cage was a pushback on the mm -hmm. fact that like, if you were going to do something on the news about protein folding, it would probably be a biologist or the PhD who they would come to get to talk about protein folding. But if it was going to be something about politics, it wasn't necessary anyone who studied politics. So I think there's a slightly different thing that we have going into this where, and that was part of the idea behind the monkey cage was, look, people work for years of their lives to learn something about this, and they have specialized knowledge. Let's give them a way to sort of talk about it. So I think political scientists have a slightly different kind of chip on their shoulder. For me personally, I just get really upset when astronomers write op-eds about politics. So. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And I'll just say, I'll just say about Steve Cohen, in interest of your full disclosure, he is on our National Advisory Committee, and you know, I assign many of his texts in our introductory you know, legacies of the Soviet Union, of course, but I, I think um, part of this without um, you know, addressing sort of some specific writings, because he has been in debates and dialogues with some of our former students on opposing viewpoints. And Dan handles this world very well, but this world of digital and social media is rough, and especially on Russia and Eurasia. It's a rough world. You stick your neck out there, especially in this kind of political climate, you are gonna get, a, you're gonna get feedback. Uh, feedback, you're not getting feedback, you're getting like an intense sort of you know, blowback. You know, you go on Fox or MSNBC, Tucker Carlson, whatever it is, um, you've got your exposure, right? But you're not gonna get a pass, right? And this gets to sort of, you know, the authority of the sort of early 80s being, you know, a correspondent and, you know, being the same sort of stature as sort of, you know, a professor in a classroom. So I think that's part of the kind of beware label, right? You get into this field, you need to have a thick skin. It comes with the territory, right? If you're making a contribution to the marketplace of ideas, you need to be able to take it, all right, and then sort of accept it too. And I think that's, you know, one thing I think Dan does extraordinarily well. Um, but um, let's leave it at that. Oh, buy his book yeah. in the back. Buy his book. Thank you, everyone. Um, hope to see you February 1st at NYU for the World Cup. Yep. And thanks to yeah, thanks to our panelists.